Okay, Gerard, you have some questions for me, sir. Oh, I definitely uh, have some questions for you, Buzz. <laughs> okay, I'm excited to hear them. I don't know what it is, but I guess <laughs> it's about firefighting. Um, <laughs> okay, shoot. All right, so the first one, I really want to break down, like, when we talk about droplet firefighting or 3D firefighting, however we want to describe that firefighting pattern. Yeah. The dynamics of the droplet are so important in helping us take heat out of the thermal layer to allow our host team to advance. Yes, that we seems don't very seem reasonable. To, but we don't seem to put much emphasis when we are teaching people. We don't put much emphasis on the pump operation or the training to make sure that we're getting the right volume of water at the right pressure to make the right droplet. Uh, now, yeah, if, that may be true. So... The way droplet firefighting works is like it's extremely effective and extremely efficient if the dynamic of the droplet is right. So my question for you is like what variables can we have? If the droplet's too big, how much inefficiency is that going to bring? If the droplet's too small, we know that that's going to bring a lot of inefficiency because we're just not going to go anywhere. We're going to stand at the front door doing this. But if the droplet's too big, because you're going to get to that, that midpoint range where the droplet is too big to really cool gases, but not big enough to really cool surfaces. Uh, oh, it's a huge question. Well, the first thing I want to say is, is that... sorry. <laughs> no, but it is. No, it's not like I just know where to start. So one thing I... The first thing I thought what, when you started about droplets is that we have to recognize that. And just one issue. So let's say we have magically have a droplet. Let's talk about the size and pressures and so on afterwards. Uh, uh, it doesn't magically end up in the smoke layer. Um, even if we have a right size droplet, we have this this overpressure in front of the droplet and the underpressure behind it. We have this all drawings everywhere in the world where, where you have a smoke layer in the drawing and you make some kind of ped, you know pedagogically correct drawing and the droplets go in and they merge with the smoke layer and, and boom, it doesn't work like that because the, 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 the droplets shoot and push everything away. So you have you have a you have it's not just about the droplet size, in that sense. Uh, it, it's there is a problem with, with the droplets actually getting time enough in the smoke. Um, uh, just an example: the fog fighter back in the day in Sweden, when we started with with offensive firefighting, it was a it was a hollow cone. So it it I don't, I don't, honestly don't know. Had haven't had this much talk about the people who designed the TA fog fighter are 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 dead um cancer and died really the project manager there's no one really to talk about and so Matt Rosander who's still alive he was just sort of just part of writing the initial specs and, and had really like the technical details and so on they're sort of lost in history uh some of it so I don't know what was sort of just ended up being one way or just really a design choice but anyway if you have a um um uh, uh, hollow cone it's easier to get the droplets to mix with the smoke because there's not a there's not a single ball of water shooting in front of you but anyway if you shoot long enough they will rotate back to the side and you will get that mixture you will get that the actually the droplets meeting meet in the water so so that's one issue that the at least the european fire service and the american i would say because nobody really thought about these things in that sense maybe a small portion of some firefighters here and there but at a large scale nobody cared or nobody knew more understood so even regardless of droplet size if you don't have that if the if they never meet they don't care so a lot of the theory around droplets just assume that the that the droplet is in the smoke which is not true like it, it just assumes yeah. that it's passing by so if you calculate a droplet size going through a smoke layer you calculate low well, sort of how how small does it have to be to vaporize before it gets to the other side what is the optimal distance you tr travel and so on then you get to the 0 0.3 millimeter droplet if you now you have different size to measure droplet which is in, in itself a whole science uh you guys but, don't carry venues I thought you Swedish guys carried verniers with you so you could measure your droplets as they come out. <laughs> it's a couple of... No, we're so trained that we do it optically. We could just look at those droplets. So compared to the Australians, we're well trained. Um, uh, no. So we, so so it, the theory is lagging in that sense because, again, it's the, the assumption that we actually are moving. Like we take one droplet, it wouldn't move that much. It would instantly vaporize. 
uh, <clears throat> so that's one thing. The other thing I really, when I th think about this concept, you want to have small droplets because the uh, logarithmically, it's just a massive difference. Like if, we, if you have the size of droplet, you just four eight times increase the amount of surface area. So like it's logarithmic, it's just exponentially better at absorbing energy fast. Uh, but like you said, if the droplets are too small, they don't travel anywhere. The air resistance is too big and they just stop. And again, that's the 0 0.3 droplet that it was calculated. It's got enough momentum. It's got enough mass to actually go anywhere. But then you, you have to take into account, you know, like the push-pull effect of other droplets. And probably if you want to throw droplets far, but you want to go cool, cool efficiency, you want a different size droplets. Like if you take a dry chem extinguisher, what's the difference between a really good dry chem, like a powder, uh, compared to a poor one? Well, this this chemistry, depending on which kind of yeah. actual particle it is, but it's also particle the, the size. The more atomized it is, the better yeah. that dry chem is. Like, no, that's why not, we hit the extinguishers. No? Yes, yes, and no. But you want to have big drop. You want to have big powder particles because they drag drag the small ones after them. So you want the small yeah. ones to rapidly absorb energy, but they don't have any distance. So if you want to throw the dry chem any distance, you want to have big ones that pull the small ones behind them, which is what you get in a in a fog, for instance. You you will get a massive distribution of different droplets. So you get that you get the smaller ones, you know, following the other ones. But you need some time. If you do a short pulse, you probably have good good range of droplets. It's the problem is that there's no. The duration of the spray is so short it doesn't have to pick up momentum to actually pull the small droplets anywhere so i think it's more about more about the time because if you take the like a really high pressure system which has much smaller droplets you can throw them far you just have to flow for a longer period of time to get that pull push pull effect with the other droplets so i think which the is throw going to cause more mixing but also it's going to displace more stuff oh yeah of course there's, there's or smoke or yeah there's a lot of departments around the world who 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 tried with higher pressure on the nozzle and for interior firefighting, and you go like, no, everything is pushed everywhere, so that doesn't seem to work. So that so the has to be sort of larger to to not push everything around, but then again, you lose efficiency. Um, um so if you want it, wait, it's just so if 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 you have a fog, again, you you try to you want to get the air, the smoke to mix with the air. You want to have the drop as small as possible, but again, as soon as you start flowing that for a longer period of time to get those smaller droplets to travel further, you 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 introduce a lot of mixing, which is really good if you want to do like a piercing nozzle attack, or if you arrive to a fire compartment, you put your nozzle inside the doorway or inside the gap of the door, and you put it to a fog. That would be the absolutely most efficient way to suppress that fire, no doubt about it. Uh, as long as you don't entrain air from the outside. So you have to put that fog basically over the threshold of the door doorway. If you're half a meter yeah. out, you will have a problem, at least to some degree. But as soon as you get it in. So that would be the absolute one. And, and I think uh, that is a crucial part of firefighting that we cannot forget. Like piercing also, if you don't have a piercing also in your fire truck, you're probably doing something wrong. <laughs> like yeah. op operationally uh, at some point. And the higher pressure yeah. that has, the better. Now pressure yeah, for so, uh, yeah yeah sorry you keep going pressure yeah it was kind of bringing into pressure but yeah so pressure is really important because making droplets you can do it making droplets in different ways but but typically which is this technically simplest one is that you need pressure to to mechanically break them apart now you can have if you if you have what pressure does is increases the velocity of water so the faster the velocity the higher the mechanical force when it hits that baffle or hits the sides or hit other droplets or spinning teeth like the more mechanical force we have the more the better droplets we create in the sense that it gets smaller if that's what we want so pressure has been basically the way of creating droplets um and again, you can meet a different way. Now you can do it differently, like the, the like the new French nozzle, the, this basic where you take air and basically with air pressure you mechanically break up the droplets into smaller smaller things. So, or you can do it in, in, in other ways also. So so pressure is important if you want to make droplets, which is which is why one thing I have in my head which I haven't really settled on is when you do straight stream gas cooling. So one one. One aspect of doing straight stream gas cooling is is uh, 
or one philosophy or one way of looking at it is that when you flow water over surface you cool the surface down and the surface cool of course cool the smoke like that that would and if you if you talk when for instance you will talks about stretching gas cool on it is you know like you want to have you want to water riding the surfaces and, and the surfaces then cool off the smoke that's sort of how they talk about it mostly i don't agree with that at all i don't think first off water runs off for surfaces if you if you flow, flow it in a, you can put papers on the walls, different places, and you and you flow a straight stream. It doesn't ride the surfaces really well, it, at least not to that that extent. So there's a lot of surfaces not getting any water at all. So first off, I think it's it's not really accurate to say that it rides the surfaces really well, uh, especially if you have normal surfaces like not a plexiglass, which sometimes you yeah. do like on that you have a. Like ceiling fans, yeah, there's things all that like that is stuff. scattered and gold. And even if you have like a rough paint, like you make a huge difference in how far the water actually travels the surface and then does the fall down and, and waters. But anyway, if the, even if that was true, we would ride walls. It, you wouldn't get as fast a drop in temperature because sort of sort of an indirect effect. It would take a while for the smoke to actually sort of radiate the energy to the surface and don't get radiation back because the surface is not cold. It just sort of take a while because there's stuff in between. There's other smoke in between. Now we're seeing this instant effect. So to me, it's still the fog doing the work in terms of smoke cooling. We want to cool the surfaces, so that's great. Like we want to have water everywhere, but it's just, it is, it is the, it is the, still the droplets doing the work. It's just the creating the fog in a different place, which is very important because it's depending on how where we rotate, where we entrain air, and so on. But just for droplets, I still still think it's very important that we get the right droplet size because of, of to increase efficiency. So my, my, what I'm struggling with right now is, so you either go high flow, low pressure, because the flow is the one thing that's important. Of course, it's flow important, uh, because the more water we have, the more cooling absorption we can do. And the more water flow over the surfaces, the less steam you get, because it doesn't have to raise the temperature as much. And so that might have a lot of benefits. But on the other hand, it's the smoke cooling that's doing, it's the droplets that's doing the work, I think, most of the work. And if we get steam production, if we have good smoke cooling, we're condensing that steam back into droplets and, and colder and colder droplets, which makes the steam a non-issue also. So if we have really good smoke cooling from the straight stream, it also should, at least in theory, make, make it better. So what happens if we do straight stream with seven bars, like a European more type nozzle, rather than three or four bars, like a lot of the American departments, can we have the same effect on the fire but a high, higher efficiency what happens if we raise the pressure to let's say 15 bars at the nozzle which typically no system in the world has even if you have a hose reel that's 40 bar at the nozzle you typically have seven bars so if we really had 15 bars at the nozzle like an hma system that's manufactured in the united states which is one of the few that actually have a higher nozzle pressure like 10 bars or 12 or i don't know exactly how high they go but the higher velocity you have leaving that stream, the, the more force it hits the surface, the more force it hits the surface, the more powerful is the fog. You rotate the space, which in that case I think is a good thing, and you create better droplets. So if the pressure is higher, it might be that more efficient. And the only research that really is to support this is like ATF made research with the HMA system in, in America. So the alcohol, tobacco, and firearm. And they had... Um, as cool as fast cooling of the space down, uh, regardless of looking at the flow, as with the traditional straight stream nozzle with a, with a lay flat hose line. But there's so little studies to to really draw on. But that was a very serious study, and it, it was it was so so. I think there's there's definitely something there that's important that we still want. Regardless if we do fog firefighting or if we do piercing nozzles or we do straight stream, I think there's a place for pressure. Because pressure, of course, if we, let's say that it's equal, let's say low pressured high flow is equal as high pressured um, lower flow, um, yeah. the high pressured host line is much better to work with. And you can get a smaller line, which is stiffer, which creates a lot less problem with kinking and all, all those things. It requires you have a smaller fire truck. You can have more duration of the water. Like now we're getting efficient, not just effective. So I think that's uh, the, the the pressure is still, I would say, I guess, pressure 
is still probably very important, I think, to, to get to sort of effective and still effective and efficient and simple firefighting, which might be high pressured straight stream firefighting. And then you go like, how, how high pressure? I don't know where the yeah. sweet spot is. But at some There's point, so many variables in, yeah. in that pressure too. Like your build, your built environment's different to my built environment. So I've got jet rock plasterboard roofs, right? Yeah, we but... go in using an ultra high pressure stream with any decent amount of volume behind yeah. it. We're just going to cut through that <laughs> if it's too sharp. Yeah, that might be a yeah. problem. Well, in Swedish, yeah. Swedish buildings are less like paper paper houses. <laughs> Uh, still, has, there's still wood framed houses like in Sweden, and we don't have a yeah. problem because it typically is not just a gypsum board. Maybe it's something behind yeah. it. There's, there's like a sub. This is like a decorative ceiling, and then it may be behind that there is there is an OSB or, or it might be something. So it's it's typically not a problem that it goes through it. But it was it was one of those things. When I started with straight stream, I was worried. Like like to say we have drop ceiling where where the, those plates, you know, we have a hidden space under that. Like how would that work? And I, my my thinking was, well, the straight stream will just go through that, and you will cool the space above that. But you don't you get very poor cooling below you. But it's such it's such a violent thing that happens that just, water just goes everywhere. That's drop yeah. ceiling start to just pushes everything around and it's just falling down. It's, it's just a mess. And and that's really good because you get a lot of distribution of those droplets and it flies everywhere and you just get good cooling. So that turned out to be sort of a non-issue. It might even be positive because now you're also cooling that that hidden space above your head, which you wouldn't do with the fog. It, was, it would remain maybe a, a place where you get a smoke ignition or something. Um, but and it, it is an issue. About that. We've always talked about that with our guys whenever we've set, suggested a straight stream gas call because people are like, oh, what if we're punching through the roof or what if the roof's failed and, and now we've got, it just goes up into the ceiling space and I'm yeah. like, well, in the ceiling space, there's a roof. Yeah. So it's still going to hit stuff. It's still yeah. going to cool stuff. It's still going to bring it down. We build a lot of tile roofs here, yeah. you know, single tile. Yeah. And they're like, oh, what if you blow one of them off? And I'm like, well, you've made it even better now because all the heat can escape and we can cool <laughs> and heat's escaping and droplets are happening and things are getting better. Yeah, and, and I think, I mean, and I think it, it's, I mean, you're not keeping your, your, your stream still. Like if you do a transition attack, that's one of the things that after that we got into, like a transition attack, if you're standing close to the facade, going straight up, keeping your stream steady, now that might, might ruin the effect of a transition attack because let's say you, you just hammer through that gypsum board and you end up in, in the room above that. And sure, it's nice to cool that space, but that was not your objective. You want to cool the first space. Like if you do an interior attack, you're just whipping your stream back and forth. I don't see a real I don't see really that happening. I mean, the Americans are doing me straight stream for years, and they also, at least some parts of America, have paper houses. And and it doesn't seem to be a problem that you're just vaporizing the ceiling and now you have nothing to work with like you have you have nothing to bounce it on it doesn't seem to be a problem uh so you're, yeah. you're moving that stream constantly and, and i don't i know i don't see I, I i don't see that as a big issue and when i when i think back to my own experiences fighting fires how many times have you put a stream through a wall like never do you know what i mean like it just yeah. hits the wall and breaks up because the mass is there and it just spreads out that force across the mass yeah no um yeah. I mean, you can't, yeah, but, I mean, like if you go high pressure, like the Cobra, for instance, like if you go, yeah. if you go way higher pressures, like if you, like a Cobra will, it's will taking a Cobra in. Yeah. <laughs> you got a Cobra, you go like three meters in front of you, keep it still, it will, it will punch through that, that wall and go to the other side. But after five meters, it, nothing happens because it's the, the stream is broken up. Now, but that's an insane amount of pressure coming out of a small hole, which is 300 bars instead of seven. Like so that, yeah. whole, that's a whole different range of of, of problems. Um, yeah. So no, I, I don't think that. But but I, I mean, I don't know if that was a, a segue to your initial questions about pressures and flows. Oh, so what what we wanted. Like, so what I'm trying to establish is that pressure and flow is important to make a good droplet, right? Yeah. And whether we're doing straight stream cooling or fog cooling. Yeah. But now let's transition into probably the, the tall and complex environment where we don't get to dictate 
pressure and flow because we're utilizing a standpipe system. Yeah. And we have pressure reducers, we have system restraints, we have all this type of stuff. Is droplet firefighting, basically what I'm going to say is, is droplet firefighting suitable for some standpipe operations? Because I know in Australia, our minimum requirement for a standpipe or for a hydrant outlet is 600 litres a minute at seven bar. Now, to me, and, and and that's at the hydrant outlet. That's not with the hose. That's not with the nozzle. Yeah. That's at the hydrant outlet. So I think, in my mind, we use 38 millimeter hose for our high rise. We're kind of getting that disgusting droplet that's kind of too big to, but too small. You know, yeah, it's not doing yeah. enough. Yeah. It's not doing enough surface cooling or spread out cooling, but it's too small to do any real good gas cooling yeah. as well. So it's just going through surfaces and probably falling on floors or touching walls and then just evaporating straight away because it's got no mass to match the mass of the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, in, in Sweden, uh, stamp bars are like pressure. You can pressurize them up to like 25 bars. They're, they're like they're, they're fairly sturdy. And in Sweden, we typically have done traditionally up to up to eight floors, which are typical high rise. Because above that, there's the laws changes. You have to have ink like like a pump a pump for the building, or you have to be section different different things. Uh, but let, let's say up to eight floors, and that's I mean, you could put the, the the pump to twelve bars or thirteen bars at the at the engine, and and sort of compensate for the height, uh, and it that has seemed to work. Uh, other places in the world, you don't you can't get that high pressures from the actual engine, like in a lot of American engines, you can't get that. High. You have to have special engines that could reduce, reduce even that kind of pressures, or you the standby system doesn't it, it's not pressured to, to you can't pump that high pressures. Or maybe there's uh, two diameters too low. Maybe there's too much debris in it. That's, that there's multiple problems, of course, that can happen if you, that's not a cute case. Now, regardless of that, if you don't, if you don't, if you, you flow test, and you you probably have to go out and flow test and stuff like that to really see how your environment does actually react. But if it, like you say, if you're not, if you don't think you can match the the design pressure that the nozzle needs, basically, if you have a seven bar nozzle. Let's say even automatic, like the TFT automatic or something. If you go from seven bars or to five bars at the nozzle, you 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 have not only made the droplets worse because it can't. It's not like it magic. It will fully increase the pressure of the nozzle up to what we get to seven bars. So the droplets are worse, but you probably half the amount of flow. So now you're now down to if it's designed for three hundred liters per minute at seven bars. Now you're down to one hundred and fifty. With with worse droplets, which is a, of course a yeah. huge difference, and you won't notice a lot because firefighters are not used to feeling that difference. And you got a hose line behind you, which of course takes a lot of firefighters won't notice. So that I think that's a big problem. So uh, you probably don't want, I definitely not want automatics if you do that. I, I think it might be a problem with automatics anyway, um, even though a lot of and bad. Well, we can talk about that later, but it. it it definitely a, a, a source for error. So if you have a seven bar nozzle without automatic and you reduce pressure, you, sure you get worse uh, droplets, but at least you maintain sort of roughly the flow. Like if, if you go from seven bar to five bars on a, on a, on a non-automatic nozzle, maybe you lose 20% of flow or something. It, it's not a huge deal, but the droplets, droplet quality would definitely go down if you want to do fog cooling. Okay, so you want to do straight stream cooling? Maybe it's even better because you get larger droplets, yeah. which will flow through the, through and everything. But again, it it might make it worse in that sense that if if it is that you want the the the, the velocity hitting the stream walls uh, to break down the droplets to make let's say the three hundred liters you had at that point, let's say it's three hundred liters, uh, you want them to behave as the American. 600 liters at three bar maybe that's not enough now you're at 300 liters at five bar and that's not the same as 600 liters at at three bars maybe because you're not yeah. compensating the energy hitting the wall making better droplets with, with with flow so now maybe you are at a let's say a worse worse you're 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 in the worst position so you either you don't have pressure you don't have flow like 
sort of the optimal. You're in in, the, in between. Now it may, makes sense. To, maybe it makes sense to go to four bars, so three bars, and 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 pump just pump pump. Uh, so yeah, with a bigger hose line, of course, than thirty eight, maybe to get less uh, friction when you get up in those volumes. Like because at three hundred liters per minute, you can have a thirty eight, no problem. Yeah. But if but if you want to go up to four hundred and four hundred fifty, five hundred liters per minute, you have to really get up to higher pressures going into that hose line. Now you probably have to be at ten bars at the at the outlet of this of this standpipe to get those pressures. So you need a you need a bigger hose line. Uh, as soon as mm -hmm. you, I mean, the the logarithmic, like as soon as you go above four hundred, that be four hundred, five hundred, six hundred, the the amount of friction you're getting at a typical hose line just increases exponentially. It's a huge difference. So then you probably have to go to forty five or fifty one or or something like that to to get that kind of flow to compensate for the loss of pressure. Yeah, but there's because the pressure. Obviously, yeah, because, the thing that's helping us the most with busting everything up. Yeah, but it yeah. might. It might. I mean, there's not. A, there's. A, there's not a lot. There's no research in this. There's no reason to go like, okay, so the cooling space. If we take a straight stream, uh, is there a noticeable difference between, let's say, seven bars at an nozzle and and three hundred fifty liters per minute straight stream and three bars and uh, 600 liters per minute. Like how would those two things react when you do straight stream in a room? There's no difference. There's no comparisons because nobody does straight streams with high pressure uh, mm. besides HMA and that started with ATF. That's the only one I know about. So there's just yeah. so little data to really draw on. It's just sort of theories and that little thing backing it up that it might be this. Now, if, if it were up to me, uh, uh, at this point, like, because you can't do an HMA system, you can't do 40, 50 bars at the pump at eight floors up or 15 floors up. I would just go low pressure and big line. That would yeah. seem to be, to be, to be the sort of the, from what we know now, the safest option to, to get a lot of flow at a, at a, at a lower pressure. And that we know works. I would say yeah. to increase the flow rate density to such a stage that no fire can overcome it. You yeah, know, yeah. like if you've got that that yeah. mass, yeah, that 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 heavy mass there, it's just gonna yeah. suck all the energy out of it. Yeah, and and if which you then, have if you have a big problem with debris, which I don't have in Sweden, and I talk a lot about countries in Europe, and they go like, we have never had an issue with this. But if there is an issue with debris, sure, go smoothbore. But I'm yeah. not a smoothbore advocate. I think the smoothbores have a lot of disadvantages. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have a problem going in the smooth bore at this point, but, but I don't see it really. I I really like to have a fog at different places in in the, in the layout. If nothing else, to get really efficient hydraulic ventilation. But uh, but if you have problem with debris, go smooth bore. Yeah, and and we don't generally have too much problem with debris. Like there is debris in some standpipes that we've come across, but they're very old because our systems are usually kept wet. Yeah. I, I think we've only got eight dry risers in, in our fire service yeah. area. So you just don't get that oxidization um, no. that you get in, in other systems. I've asked yeah. around Sweden and, I, you know, and not even anecdotally, I get like any, any support for that being an issue, which should be, which would again, would, would be an issue. And I, I th honestly, I think a lot of the American fire service are just making it. It's just going, oh, that's another, that's another advantage of smoothbore. Let's, let's push that. You can push a golf ball through it. Go like, do you have golf balls in the standpipes? And, but yeah. to be fair, I, I don't want to say it. some, some might have problems. A lot of problems, you know, most firefighters talk about America. Look, we've never heard of that, that being an issue. Uh, it's just called like that, that might be an issue. So let's pick smoothbore. Yeah. Again. If you have yeah. that issue, if someone listening, you have that issue, like we always have this issue, go with smoothbore. I don't have a problem at all with that. Yeah. Yeah. Go with it. No one's going to hold it against you. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, Which is... oh, Gerard. They will. They will. <laughs> they will. I've never understood. I've never understood the fight between it. Like. The smoothbore straight stream? Uh, I just like. I, I get there's different advantages and disadvantages to each nozzle, right? 
Uh, but I've never needed to die on a hill over the differences. No, no for sure not. This is, a, <laughs> this is a very small issue. No, I don't understand it either. I mean, there might be small issues going back and forth, like one is better than the other. No, the, the real issue, the, the, big, the big question, of course, is you want to go with fog or straight stream or, or smooth or solid stream, call it whatever you like. Uh, that's one of the big issues because it, like, it dictates how, what, what are your foundation for training? And again, I've switched. Mm -hmm. It's not a, like this. It's just I go like, no, nah, I think that you start with straight stream and then maybe the gold star or the advanced class is just to go for fog when it needed or more efficient. That's one big issue. And the other issue, of course, is the pressure versus flow. Do we still want high pressure yeah. straight stream or do we want to go with low pressure straight stream? Is flow better than pressure and so on? That's, that's another one, I think. But that, again, those two are the big issues. Um, but I think it. I just what I think it, it's it's connected to to smoothbore being like the anic at the antidote to to mediocrity, and a lot of people see mediocrity as like people having fog, that not knowing why they have fog, and they go fog sometimes or pressure fog, and they're like power cone and so on in America. Go like no, we we're anti that, so we want a smoothbore because that's the furthest away we get from from fog cooling and stupid Europeans. Uh, so you go like we want to go furthest in that direction, but no, I don't like a no, I don't really understand it either. <laughs> no, um, but that's that's a great segue into a couple of other topics that we want to get onto. But before we do move on, I just want to ask you one other thing. So like, you think that um, that straight stream gas cooling is coming majority from the droplet size and not from cooling the surfaces, because yeah. as I understand it, and like this is just. You actually opened my eyes to this a few years ago, um, and then you sent me on a path that just thinks a lot about heat, so thank you for that. <laughs> but basically, mass plays a big game in it, and again, it's like your um, mass mass over temperature plays a big game, just like you're talking now with pressure and, and volume of water. There's like an X point where it's perfect, but we've got to think that the, the smoke inside the building is less dense and definitely and extremely less dense than the air going in sitting on top it's not and then the walls are more dense than the smoke because they're solids and that kind of stuff right so yeah, if we are. cool them rapidly yeah does that then cool the light mass smoke rapidly as well as the droplets and all that kind of stuff like it has to be a combination doesn't it oh absolutely i mean and you can't get into a fire compartment with doing one without the other like it's it's might be even a theoretical reason but uh, one thing that i started with was the transition attack so you, you go from outside and even if you have to like a push, little shallow like a shallow stream not not ideal like this it, the amount of surfaces will actually hit is really small yeah. and you still still get instant cooling and that doesn't make yeah. sense if it was just cooling the surfaces which again like you said the solids on surface had much more mass the amount of energy they absorb is really, really large. But yeah, it's two things that make me think that there others might be more things, but uh, I think that it's still the droplets doing the work when it surfaces. One is, let's say the, the, the wall is 300 degrees at the surface and it's cold and cold yep. and cold. It's, I mean, it's really hot, but still, that's cold for being flame. Yeah, that's real cold. Like, so so like, yeah. if you have hot smoke that's burning, and let's say five, five six hundred degrees hot smoke, or even burning fifteen hundred degrees, the the wall is still stealing energy from the from the flame. If yep. you, it, like like three hundred degrees towards hundred degrees in a wall doesn't make a lot of difference compared to to fifteen hundred. Like you so, don't think it would make a, a ton of difference? Like oh, it, it will definitely make a difference. But but again, like if you take a a cold surface versus a hot surface, it's still it's still stealing energy from the flame because it can't go the other way. It, it, it's not like 1500 degrees is radiation only goes, heat only travels in one direction. It, it is still, still mm -hmm. the wall stealing heat from the flame. And if we extinguish the flame, it's not like the wall will ignite the flame because it can't, it can't, it, like, there's, there's a, still a temperature. Can't go back. Yeah. It doesn't go back. It, it can heat the smoke to 300 degrees. That, mm -hmm. That's the only thing. It can't go higher than that. Now, of course you have certain, now, now why would, smoke ignite them well of course on the surface you might have small some smoldering combustion that smoldering combustion is 1500 degrees at the surface and that could ignite the smoke but it's such a small amount it will not heat the smoke it's not that you have a smoldering fire in a corner and boom everything is 1500 degrees 
Mm. So the mass of the wall is very important, but it's still a temperature. You can't, you can't go the other way around. The other thing is, again, if you if you have like a shallow stream transition attack and it hits just a few of those surfaces. So let's say those surfaces rapidly go from 300 degrees or 500 degrees to, to 50 or 100 degrees. Like 90% of the surfaces in that room are still at the same temperature they started with. Because yeah. of that, because it doesn't doesn't hit a lot of surfaces. Because you've only got that. that, that this that is narrow, a very like, shallow like stream. It goes in yeah. very narrowly, hit the back wall, and goes down. Yeah. Uh, and you still get instant cooling. If you take a, a metal container, you go to do a flashover demo. If you've got smoke in it, you got. I mean, the metal is at the, at the start very cold, and it's a huge difference to make a fire in a cold container and a hot container. Definitely. So you, mm. you know that the surfaces make a difference. No doubt about it. We want to cool surfaces. <laughs> so, so that's not the issue. But you still get, I mean, if you have fuel and, and, and fire, you will get roll the rollovers in the container, even if the container or, or the concrete building is, is fairly cold. It's that you, the closest, the, the, like you never get flame 20 centimeters from the wall because that part of the smoke is too cold, flowing on the surface. So in the middle, you get a ton of, of energy, a ton of, of, of flame and combustion because that's so far away from the wall, 20 centimeters, half a meter, that it, 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 does, it, take, it doesn't really be affected by that wall to, to that extent. And so I look at it and go like, how? why do we get this fast cooling? Well, it's a huge amount of droplets hitting the, hitting the surface, straight stream hitting the surface, huge amount of droplets. And, and, and when I started really looking at this with, with the with sort of when the like the FLIR cameras, which is really the first cameras that you really see flow, you just mm. see it so instantly how fast that movement of the air inside the fire compartment start to rotate, like it goes everywhere. So you're getting that smoke that's far away from the spray. It will just madly mix with with that droplets, and that goes okay. So if you have a cold, if you have a cold spray going in here. And smoke violently moving around, that smoke will get cold really fast. I mean, I, and, and I see it. In and because part, it's such a light mass too, we're moving, yeah, we're, we're recirculating this light mass. Yeah, it's easily. It, yeah. Easily, it's so it's so yeah. fast. But it it's about like if you were to take all that smoke in the room, and you would like look magically just move it towards us to the edges of the room, so that they were in close proximity to the wall. Boom, they would be cold. Yeah. But when they're just sitting there, sort of not really moving really fast and so on, they're not really in contact with the walls, even if they make them magically get cold. If you you can you can do another experiment. You can take a metal box or a container, and you fire in it, and you cool the outside of the metal, like with a sprinkler system. There's there's going back in age in time, they were just, you know trying to protect the the structural integrity of the box and paint coming off with sprinkler systems on the outside. You still get rollovers and everything. You just have to overcome that's that that surface now being cold. You would have more more yeah. fuel. You have to have to build it up. You don't get enough as as good rollovers, but you still get that in the center of the mass because the distance to the walls are, are bigger. So again, but it's still my I mean, I'm I'm going against what, for instance, you are saying, at least what they're saying, I'm not saying that they actually believe that this is the only reason, but how they describe it vocally is, you know, water running over the surfaces, the surfaces then itself cools the space down, which is, a kind of, of course, true, a portion yeah. of it. My gut feeling... It isn't the only... It, it, it's it's looking through a unidirectional lens at a multivariate solution. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So we've got that, yeah. But you still yeah, have, we got have to since the droplets. Yeah, but you still have to pick pick one, as to say, because uh, I don't necessarily have to pick one, but you have to like decide what is the most important thing for a firefighter to do. Is it to coat the surfaces, or is it to make a spray in a different place? And to me, to me, that is the most factor because it influences the most things. Where do we want to make that fog? We don't want to make it at the nozzle. We want to make it where the stream hits it. That if you if you have that in mind when you do nozzle technique with straight stream, where do I want to place my fog at this wall, this ceiling when I make it? You're gonna indirectly also cool all the surfaces, so you get that as a benefit. Mm -hmm. Like it, you you, and if you want to cool the surfaces, you don't necessarily get the fog where you, where you want it to be. So I think yeah. for me that makes more sense in trying to talk to firefighters, 
especially Europeans, who understand fog cooling. And when I say, we just want to make that fog in a different place. Yep. Everything you've been taught about fog cooling is half true because <laughs> you have to add that flow and how it rotates and doesn't magically end up in it. But if you add that portion of fog and then we say, we just want to put it in a different place, droplets are really important mm -hmm. still, surface area is still important. All those theories are correct. We just, we just modify it a little bit. They go like, ah, makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that, well, at least that, I, I think that works for me. And I think my, my theories in my head about this matches every time I do a structure fire burn or something like that. I see those effects in play. It, it, it matches what I see. That doesn't make it true, but it, at least it's anecdotal in my head ma matches what We're I see. We're getting some anecdotal stuff. And I mean, like, it's funny in the fire service, a lot of anecdotal stuff becomes true when research is applied. Yeah. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. Braidwood, was, Braidwood was talking about closing doors before Thornton actually did the math yeah. on it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and we... there is a lot. And sometimes it, it's the opposite. We have theories that end up going, <laughs> yeah, that doesn't make any sense at all. Because maybe, yeah. maybe because it was in, incomplete, for instance, like like the drop of theory of that. Like, it, it, again, the theory took into account that you'd magically place that droplet in a smoke layer and, this, and smoke st stays in the same place. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if you took that out, droplet fog really works well. But if you add, like, smoke will actually start to move. So the mixing is not very easy. And the air entrainment will, if you're in a separate compartment, will make it, it will make you pressurize everything in front of it. Like, without those two things, like in your head, the, the theory is incomplete. Which causes, of course, practic all the practical problems we see with fog. Yeah. So that's a great segue into this next next. Bit of questioning okay. that I've got for you. So, if you were to do everything again, knowing what you know now, do you think we should still train firefighters the way that we have, which is that that fog theory, that that water droplet theory, or would you step up from a look? This is how water cools things, and then the application changes to straight stream first, and then you'd move to a fog cooling where appropriate in certain scenarios. Is that what you'd teach now, or? Like if I said, hey, yeah. I know nothing about firefighting yeah. Yeah. and I've never been exposed to it, how would you go about it? Uh, well, the first thing, even before I switched to straight stream, was I started uh, a placing a lot more emphasis on surface cooling because CFBT programs, typically here when I go around in Europe, they evolved into smoke cooling programs. Yeah. Now, that wasn't, that wasn't necessarily the intent and a lot of American fire service has, has the same problems. It's just, it was a technical problem with maintaining the fire. So you go, you, you have a program where you smoke cool and then you smoke cool your way into the fire compartment, which you should, you should smoke cool your way, regardless how you do it. And, and then you get to the fire compartment and then you go, no, 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 no. Don't put the fire up because we need it for the next student. Um, so it, in it, it, stop, it, stop, 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 yeah, stop, 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 stop. We need the smoke. <laughs> Which, of course, is probably like, uh, there's so many problems with that. We can talk about training scars. But 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 yes, both American and and, and, and European sort of uh, fog cooling, smoke cooling, uh, ended up in the same place. So there, there was lot, not enough emphasis putting on actually cooling surfaces. Um, so a lot of firefighters in Sweden and so on had a good understanding what surface cooling was. And of course, understanding was important in theory, but in practice, you never sort of never did it. It was not a. It's not a important uh, problem. So I, for instance, started doing what I call a, a corner burn, um, probably ten years ago, and it, it's evolved since. Where students go in, and this is just a corner, with, you know, a corner fire. You just have a fire in a corner, but they go in, and they start with small cans and start applying water on a small fire, and they learn have to learn like the, the you have to really work with angles because you have such a small flow rate in that sense. You have to be like balanced. They have to really work get behind the debris and everything. And you have a complex fire with multiple angles and shields and everything. So you have, really have to work it. And you build that fire up more and more and more. And at some points, the radiate when when they start the fire, there will be radiation coming from above them because now the the, the ceiling yet starting to form. So now we have a second team that goes in. Okay, you need to protect the firefighters doing surface cooling. So you have to do you have to protect them from the flames above their heads. So they go in CO two, and then they go in tri cam, and then they go in with with fog, and they go in with straight stream. 
don't really care as long as you protect the firefighters because they're the heroes doing surface cooling. They're actually solving the problem, but we need to protect the firefighters doing going there. And from that exercise, we're saying, okay, now you're not two teams. You're, you're, you're by yourself. Okay, so what's the purpose of smoke cooling? The purpose of smoke cooling is just to, to make sure that I can safely go to a position where I can cool the surfaces. But by yep. splitting those things apart to beginning of, of the, the journey, they really they really start understanding that surface cooling is firefighting. Smoke cooling is, is essential, of course, to get to a position where I can safely cool all the surfaces. Um, so that was the first thing I started doing. And, and, the, and the second part was just, okay, so how do you do smoke cooling most efficiently, uh, effectively and so on, simplicity and so on. And that was the change that shift, shifted. So now, again, I would really emphasize that in the beginning, I don't care how you cool smoke. You can do it in multiple different ways. Understand that the surface cooling is an angle problem. You can't compensate an angle problem with a flow problem. So you really have to understand that because when they go in an apartment and they spray water, they're so strong and the surfaces are so small in comparison to the, the space, but it doesn't really matter if it's burning on the backside of a chair. That's a small fire, so you could just go in there. But if you arrive to a, a larger volume fires, now angles become critical in that you're spraying water on a on a big machine or whatever. If you can't get to the other side, you can never get in. It's an angle problem. And you can't compensate an angle problem with the flow problem. Like and they really have to understand that. Uh, so so when I when I teach you go like I have to teach angles first, and then after a while it becomes a, a, a flow problem. When the fire starts going big, it's a flow problem. Now they have to switch to a bigger nozzle, and you have different nozzles than when they do surface cooling. And again, smoke cooling is put on later. And then when we start talking about smoke cooling, I would definitely start with straight streams saying I would go so that they may understand that. But for me to understand straight streams, you really have to understand, at least in my head, droplet size and how the droplets interact with the smoke, where that smoke hits the ceiling, what happens when you start rotating that space, it overpressure in front of it, there's a negative pressure in here, it draws it in. How does the stream affects everything? And sometimes that is much easier to teach with a fog coming out of the nozzle. You, you, you air in chain and everything. Okay, what happens if we put this stream I have in the fog nozzle? What happens if I put that in the ceiling? Oh, it's the same thing, but it's in a different place. So at, at a theoretical level, you're teaching the same thing. You're teaching a fog placed in different positions will create different kind of flows in the room, between rooms and everything. But then when we go out and practically do it, we, we definitely start with straight stream. Yeah, and you do straight stream for ninety five percent of all the firefighters out there in the world. You would only do straight streams, basically as teaching practically. Now five percent, I could imagine being have enough tra training time, and the need for it is so high. So let's say you go to Oslo, uh, old city with m lots of uh, old wooden building construction, like two hundred year old. Uh, go to St Stockholm and so on, different old construction where water damage is a huge issue. Should they their firefighters be uh, be able to switch between different uh, styles of firefighting and you know high efficiency but low water damages but not as fast or effective at it's doing those sort of things? Yeah, I think so. If I go to my last part time station, don't get a lot of fires. Mostly fires are in single residential house and wood. If I spray water in it or not, if I drown it in water or not, doesn't make a difference because it get torn down anyway. Go like, no, they should do straight stream because they should be effective at doing rescues and protecting themselves. Property conservation is far down on that list. Yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah. and again, the theory behind how the stream works and the fog works and air entrainment is just, you need it for piercing also too. So, so, so that whole concept is still in theory the theory behind fog cooling is still as important today, even more important if you do straight stream to me. It's just that the practical outcome is that we use the straight stream for interior attack typically, uh, only I would say in, in what I teach, and maybe the gold star or advanced is maybe a little bit of fog in certain situations. Uh, but then it's, uh, it's, you know, it's just fog for piercing nozzles. But if they understand the theory, that should they should go like a piercing also through a wall or fog through a wall or a straight stream through a window. It's all the same. Yeah. It's just a matter of how to get it, it there. Yeah, it's all just different transportation methodologies. Yeah, it's just, it's just getting just, the, the yeah, droplets to getting the, the fog in, in, the, yeah. in, in that position. It's just different. Yeah, uh, and I don't, now, I don't care how you put it there. 
Now, you did mention earlier about like when you look at like a lot of CFBT programs and when I've looked at CFBT programs, there's always been that emphasis on fog cooling for, for smoke. Yeah. And I think that's that knee jerk reaction of, oh, this is different to how we used to do it. So this is, we need to put a lot of emphasis on this. And then I remember the emphasis being, oh, the branch has to be at this, like, like precious flows have to be at this. And then we start to relax those. And then we went back to, oh, the cone needs to be relative to the space of the room. We don't yeah. want to throw droplets on surfaces and all that kind of stuff. And now we're saying, hey, let's throw droplets on surfaces. And now we're starting to say, hey, guys, maybe even think about using straight streams to yeah. bounce off surfaces to cool smoke. Yeah. How do you introduce that into a program when you have traditionally said, no, nah, this is the only way to do it because this is the most effective and efficient and there's a lot of science and math that, that based this? Well, it's either revolution or evolution. That's the only choices yeah. you have. Revolu <laughs> but if you ask the communist, revolution never works. Uh, you know, it's very Just messy. Just replaced it with a new regime. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's very messy. Um, yeah. So definitely go with evolution is the first one. Like go baby steps because it's not like we have a huge issue. Everything burns down and everybody dies with with, with typically fog training. So like go yeah. like don't run over the hills. People aren't dying in droves. You know like we we need but 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 need to shift. And I mean it, I I see the same thing as I did. Like if you when the transition attack study was was released from you all was was, was like I I I we had never had an issue with. We had never had a uh, that it was forbid, forbidden to firefighters spray water from the outside, but one thing I really, of course, recognized was, oh, of course, we need to teach that too. We need to, in the firefighting program, we need to attack fires from windows like that because we know it works from the UL study and in Sweden it was it was nobody saying that it didn't work. So of course, one thing issue was we just incorporated that into that we had to incorporate in training programs. Uh, like if you arrive to a training building, there should be fire blown a window and. You don't start the training sitting at the front door, like that's bad. Yeah. That's bad training. Like that. That that's and that's yeah. It's so funny to see that. Like we talked about it. We've we've adapted a couple of transitional attacks scenarios into yeah. our recruit training now. Yeah. Because our MO in Australia for for ever has been, if there's fire coming out of the window there and you're going to walk in that door, <laughs> why don't you just put that fire out? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, 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 you jokingly say that that uh, the fire service has been a very good at at educating people out of common sense. Um, yeah. Go like, there's fire over there. Shouldn't I put it out? Go like, no, you should go in here. <laughs> Why? Because that's what we do in training. Um, now, there's a different. There, a lot of Americans would say, well, you're wasting time on the outside because most important is getting in. Uh, I wouldn't agree with that at all. The most important thing we do is to put the fire out and then we ventilate. And as soon as we can put the fire out, if that's from the outside, we can start to ventilate earlier. And that's just benefits for everyone. But uh, now there's more variables to that and just nuances. But, oh, but definitely, it's definitely. It's a whole scenario game. Yeah. Of, it's a, yes. Well, it's it's some, what happens yeah. if it's on the eighth floor? What's happening on the backside? Is it is it worth getting a host line there or should we go interior? There's, there's so many variables. But anyway, uh, so we at least you need to start training because at some point, in some stage in some situation it will definitely be good maybe there's a safety door and you can't get in okay you're not, you're not going to do anything <laughs> so there's at least some point you want to do a transition attack so of course you want to train on that but it, it took me it took me a couple of years uh and which is just a sad sad thing to look back on before i started asking myself the question like what if it works from the outside why doesn't it work from the inside uh which that, which is is hilarious because I remember when we used to put water in from the outside, we used to put it in with fogs, yeah, because of droplets, yeah. And then the UL attack study came out and went, oh, hang on, you're making things worse. And then like it was the opposite to that, where I'm like, yeah. oh yeah, if I'm pushing things out with a fog, I can push things in with a fog. Yeah, too. <laughs> yeah. it's uh, well, there's, anyway, sorry, there's so many yeah. there's so many cognitive dissonances going around. Like yeah. again, like I was I was. I wasn't even trying to, so for that, when I started realizing what well, it works with straight stream from the outside, it makes sense that you shouldn't push things in. My, my knee jerk reaction a couple of, after a couple of years was, but how do I explain that it doesn't work on the inside? It wasn't, maybe, maybe it works from the inside. Maybe the Americans, yeah. you know, at least the practically knew, knew what they're doing. It was, why doesn't it work? 
I need to, because if someone asked me, why should I do straight stream from inside? I was going to go, because it doesn't work. And this is the reason. Because to be fair, when I was in America and a lot of, you know, talk about straight stream, nobody knew why it worked. They just knew that it worked. It was like, which is one of the reasons I didn't buy into it early because they go like, they had no idea what they're talking about. They knew nothing about fire behavior. Most of what I talked about and nothing about suppression theory. They just knew they worked. They were just moving host lines, spraying water and go like the fire goes out. And go like I, I, that was not enough for me. I needed a reason why it works. So I was going like, but it worked better with the fog. Was just always to go like you could do all of the things, but it just moved better with the fog. But again, there was this, there was this break in my head when I go, <clears throat> how does it? Why doesn't work? And of course, we suddenly realized, well, but it has to work on the inside because it's the same. It, and and I started formulating my theories about how air moves and what is what is fog hits, and I go like, oh fuck it, it, it works. Now I have a theory for why, why straight stream works from outside and also from inside. Uh, but to go back to your question, so that was my, when I went, when I went, okay, but well we need to de transition here. So you start with a straight stream from the outside and make people get it. Okay. I shouldn't hydraulically ventilate into a space. I need to use a straight stream and straight stream works. I've seen it in studies. I've seen it in training and so on. Okay. Step one, step two, uh, what, what do you do if the, but it's the ceiling height is 10 meters and the, and the box is 20 meters long. Are you going to go in and do short pulse, long pulse? No. Um, which is the second problem we had because we teach CFPT programs are typically just done in small container systems all over the world. It doesn't matter if American here, we teach firefighters how to deal with small boxes. And then we go like, yeah, good luck. Uh, and they have to deal with large spaces. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just figure it out. Like it's not my problem. Uh, and magically firefighters don't like they, they go like, and they go, some go in and do fog and some will do nothing, but they won't magically switch to straight stream and go like, yeah, this is what I want to do. So then, of course, you go like, okay, if you have a larger box, then you want to you do basically a transition attack but from the inside. You want to have a straight stream. You want to shoot it in the ceiling. You want to get cooling there. It will fall droplets. It will do sprinkler, basically be on sprinkler. You get longer distance to throw those droplets in when it hits the ceiling. And boom, those are two very easy wins uh, because, the, because you're adding something that wasn't existing before. So now they start to get into like, okay, so there's a need for straight stream. Okay, sure. And that leads you into, okay, so if you're in hallway going into the fire compartment that's closed, do you want to hydraulically ventilate into the fire compartment? If you're going to that doorway, you're, you're, you're three meters away or five meters away into that, that hallway. And again, you, that leads you into discussion about, okay, so, so do you want to, do you want to, um, do you want to hydraulic event inside? And people go like, no, I've, I've been taught and we understand why it's bad from the outside. It has to be the same thing the inside because then everything will push back to me or get pushed further into the structure if, the, if there's an outlet on the other side. So as long as there's not an outlet in that compartment, we have to make sure that we don't pressurize it in front of us. And what do we do then? Well, again, we, we place that fog on the inside by hitting a surface instead of making it where you are. And that's what people go like, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Like, sort of I'm, I, whenever, whenever I'm trans transitioning between compartments, if it's outside to inside, or if it's from the hallway to the bedroom, I need to use a straight stream because I want to have that fog in place in front of me. Okay, so that gives you the next step about like, okay, so we have to teach firefighters to switch between fog and straight stream all the time, which is a huge problem and, <laughs> and, and it doesn't work. But anyway, so then you go, okay, so but if you're inside a space or you're at the doorway, you can use a fog. Okay, so use a fog because that will rotate the space more efficiently. Definitely, and it's, and it's and it's faster. No, no doubt, doubt about it. And that if you sit on, on the, go into the doorway of a fire compartment, you go with a fog, zhoop, and it, boom, it's out. Uh, but then you go like, okay, so what's your opposite? So you go from you go towards a compartment, like the, from the outside to the hallway, and you use a straight stream. You get to the doorway. Now you to switch to fog, and you do fog in the hallway. But as soon as you're getting any water towards the fire compartment, you have to switch to, to a straight stream again. And then you get to the next compartment, you have to switch to fog again and do like this. And, and firefighters can't, well, first, pedagogically can't do that uh, because they, they don't know the nozzle well enough. So it would just be a mess. By, by Yes. By the time they've done that, the straight stream, the one who goes to straight stream would just be finished and ventilated the structure and everybody's out. Not as much as that, but it, just, it becomes very inefficient if they don't train a lot. But that one is if you if you're doing straight stream into the hallway and you're actually throwing water further into the hallway, you would have suppressed that hallway. So when you get get up to the actual threshold where you could use a fog, there's not enough not a lot of reasons to start cooling. 
like I see a lot of CFPT programs. Because you're buying the building back, aren't you? Like technically, like like that's how we've talked about it yeah. when we've had our discussions in in my circles. Is if I call this surface here as I'm yeah. progressing that one, I've bought that back. Yeah, you, you, the yeah. Finder has to work you really really that. hard to heat that yeah. back up. Yeah, yeah, and definitely. So continue yeah. to go through. Yeah. You're 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 cooling ahead of you if you say you're winning further ahead of you if you're buying it back and yeah. you're taking control of it you know ab absolutely yeah. so if you're in the hallway and you're getting you're progressing towards the bedroom let's say it's on fire and you start doing a straight stream because you know you can't transition with it by the time you're up towards where the bedroom is and you start using straight stream on the way either if you're flowing and moving or flowing all the time uh, and that bedroom will be practically knocked down. When you get to that position, so there's not a lot of need to go with it. But you look at those CFBT programs, a lot of times they're like, they're, they're letting a compartment build up, build up, build up. They're sitting on basically outside a window. And then they go, look at how fast that is. Yeah. But if you were to progress towards that space, it would already be cooled when you get there. So that like you have, you build on those steps and go like, how much need is there for a fog on the inside? Like not a lot. Um, now the, the last stage, which I'm on right now, um, is that it, it is the, the question of rescue versus property. So it, I went back to, because the, the Americans were right, but they sort of didn't know why they were right. At least they couldn't explain it. Um, we just think this is good for rescue, but we can't really explain you why, at least not something I understood or, or bought when I heard the arguments. So I went back to first principles about like how. For rescue, for instance, what do we want? Well, we want to ventilate as fast as possible. That's the absolutely most important thing. And, and we want to knock the fire down as fast as possible to be able to ventilate. That's that's sort of went back to first principle. But if we talk about the path, just the, the path where you want to knock the fire down to get to ventilation, that, that path, okay, well, what do we want to do? We want to lower the temperature as much, fast as possible in the smoke and on the surfaces. We want to limit that as fast as possible to reduce toxicity from the walls, meaning pyrolyzed, you know, toxic gases. We want to reduce temperature in smoke because a lot of shit just condenses, like gases and, and it goes back into being liquids and follow it up that, that are toxic and gases so on. We actually will, even though there's not a science on this, but it will definitely, if you have a lot of droplets going through the air, you will start to, to, to a lot of, Toxic gases are water soluble, so, you, so a lot of those things you might start trapping water and falls down. And of course, all the steam you're creating, which which is an issue and and might not be an issue, and nobody says an issue. It's just a mess. <laughs> I would do a very interesting podcast with a, with a medical doctor in a couple of weeks, which would be interesting. Yeah. Guess he has a lot of thoughts about this. But anyway, uh, steam is for sure a problem if you just place people in a hot steamy environment they will die if it's anything above 60 70 degrees celsius they will die very quickly because you, you breathe down so it's such hot air and now the, the the counter argument would be if you're in that kind of environment the toxic gases will kill you anyway so like the steam doesn't matter and that might be true too so steam might be an issue but it still might not be an issue because you would still be dead by the toxic gases so in that case you go like is it important? Because the thing I want to get to is if you have, if you cooling faster, you're condensing water, drop steam down to droplet water and getting the droplets to, to fall on the surfaces and you get in those droplets to go colder and colder faster. So at this point, the safest option is to assume that steam is, is bad. Um, and we want as less steam as possible. Assume that we want to have the temperature down in the smoke to condense steam and all those other things fast down as possible. And every study shows that the more flow we have given the same amount of pressure, the faster we drop temperature. So we want to have as much flow as possible. We basically want all the water we can everywhere at the same time to, to reduce yeah. the amount of steam, to condense everything in down. We basically want to do that to the extent that we don't lose speed. Because that's, I think, doing it If you lose speed on your interior attack, now there's speed is very important. So there's a balance here. Bring basically take as much water as you can uh, without losing speed. And that depends on how many crews you are, how well trained you are, what's the layout of the building. There's so many variables. But but basically that's the that's the, the that's the, the the equation. So when I got to the, the last part, which was I think if you're in a rescue mode, you want to use as much water as you can and just flow, 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 flow because that makes much more sense 
um, uh, from that also, which also takes away going like, if you do that with a fog and you don't have an outlet, you're going to create a mess. Like, and if, and if yeah. you're going to go fog, full fog, straight stream, and at, at the same time work with a host line, go like, no, no, that doesn't work at all. Uh, so it becomes practically impossible. So that was the thing that, that really pushed me really over the edge that you, you want to teach fog, you want to teach straight stream, you want to cool as much as possible, you want to have high flow, just flow if you're in rescue mode. Now, if you're in, if you're in proper conservation mode, like we are most in Sweden, I would say, because uh, if if uh, we deem the the, the the building to be empty, I'm not saying different fire service, different rules. Some say even if, even as a credible person standing outside and saying, hey, it's empty, my family's out. Some departments will say, fuck it, we, we, it's not empty until I say it is empty. Yeah. Uh, fine, if you have that rule, fine. I don't. That's a separate issue. But if yeah. we think it's empty... If you deem it to be empty, we're in property conservation mode. And that in that case, again, going back to like Oslo, that sense, it makes a lot of sense to not do a lot of water and do it very nicely. We want to cool it down because in CFP, we're basically taught cool it, down, cool it down to the point where it's not flammable. And then you stop because you don't want to add more water. You want to have steam up there. You want to have this amount of toxic acid because we got protective gear and so on. You just want to make it non-flammable to get the fire part and cool it down and then ventilate. Fine. But if yeah. you're in rescue mode, that it might not be the best for the victim. Uh, and it, there still is an argument that it doesn't matter. Again, that if you are in that environment to start with, you're dead. If it's that mm -hmm. much toxic gases, you're already dead. And if we add it with steam, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, so, but again, first, going back to that, I saying this the final step is just you just want to use a ton of water. So if you have that progression, you start with getting them to adopt things that we don't, didn't typically teach in CFPT programs, and then you start tweaking it. Eventually, you go like, "Oh fuck it, I don't, I, you know, like, I'm buying it." But one thing that's really important: every time we make a change, like nobody wants to change. Nobody. There's not a single human being in the world because to change, you have to accept that you were wrong before, yeah. which fucking sucks. And two, you have to make the work to make the change, which for most people sucks too. Like it's extra work. So nobody wants to change. To get rid of the first one, I was wrong before. The best way, if you can, you're going to create an easy out. So let's say for you all, it was in America, it was, oh, the, the, the fire has changed, so we have to change. We can't ventilate as aggressively as we did. Okay, that was 30 years ago. You should have figured that out. But let's yeah. give firefighters an easy out. You are excellent at communicating. The fires changed, just happened last week. Uh, and now we need to change. Firefighters go like, oh, it was we didn't do anything wrong. It was something yeah. else that happened, and now we have to change. So so excellent way of communicating. It was horribly wrong, but it still worked. When the thermal imager came, go like now it makes a lot of sense to go straight to the fire because we can find it faster, ventilate rather than just search blindly following a wall. No, I don't care about the wall. If you get room layout, you go straight to the fire. Don't go with right, right hands to the walls. That was yesterday. Easy out. We didn't, you didn't do it wrong before, but now we have a tool that changes everything. So it might be now we have new knowledge. Now we need new new cameras. Now like a technology, something happened. Something some external factor happened. So what you did before was right. Now we just need to switch. Okay, that's an out. And that's that's if you don't have an out, you will have fought people fighting because they want to protect what they've been doing. Yeah. So that's that's really important. Any change you make, find an out. Make sure that you don't push people into a corner. Uh, yeah. Like I, I typically do, which is true, like the old firefighters that are um, probably the most resistant to change. I will just say you were right to start with. Yeah. Like people go like, oh, we used straight stream in the past. Go like, what's the <laughs> easiest way to get them on board with this change now again? Go like, you were doing it right. We, we, we didn't understand this. We didn't understand this, but we have to do it differently because back then you didn't cool smoke. You just waited until you saw fire. Okay, now we have to cool smoke. And we add those bits and pieces pieces but they're going like to like, ah we were right to all along and for the rookies they go like oh this is how you're trained it's not your fault you did exactly as we taught you now we have new data new evidence new tools whatever it might be we need to tweak it like this it's not your fault so that's one mm -hmm. and two of course is to how do you make that transition easier go like you don't have to relearn a lot of things because the fog is still yeah. doing the heavy lifting 
We're so just contextualizing all, all, how to yeah. throw that from Yeah. We just need to train yeah. on moving with a straight stream and so on. And you don't want to go. That, that's one other problem I have, sort of with the with the with the one one aspect of America. A lot of they go like, okay, so now we need heavy large flow. We're gonna do straight stream. Now we're gonna spend four hours every week on the parking lot moving a host line. Go like, no, I'm not gonna trade one problem to another one. We had a training problem with fog. We didn't train enough to actually make it work. Also, other problems. I'm not gonna trade that towards being dragging host line on the street for four hours to be able to move a low pressure, high flow line efficiently, because people won't do that. Firefighters don't want to go out in the parking lot and train. That's that's a, that's the one percent who will do that. That's not a way of implementing something. So we find that balance between how do we, how much flow can we take uh, in in relationship to nozzle pressure to have a low enough nozzle reaction so that you basically can move without a lot of training. Of course, you give them some tricks and how to use it and so on. And how do we make a line that's not too heavy so that people can work with it again without a lot of, a lot of training? With, so with two people, not five people, you know, two people. Yeah, we just have two generally. people. Yeah. Like some departments, in the United States go like, "Oh, what's the problem?" Well, you have like ten people staffed on a host line in every every corner. That's that's not the norm. That's the, the four departments in the world that can do that. Like the norm is two firefighters should go in and basically have no support without maybe someone on the outside doing feeding hosts. That, that's the norm. You can't have a, a, high, a, a, a kink, uh, a line that kinks very easily. It doesn't work. You can't drag it. It will get stuck everywhere and it will get flow. You have to have a high pressure or you have to have a line that's very sturdy, like the, some of the newer American lines where it, it kinks. It can be low pressure, but still very sturdy. Now it becomes heavy and, and, and other things, so it, it's hard to work with. I don't know if it's necessary to go that low flow route, but it, but but I don't want to again. I want to, I don't want to pre- trade one training problem to another one that that I know will not work. Yeah, so you have to find that balance between make it easy. And I mean, look, there's things that we can pick up in that space around hose movement and stuff. Like I know generally when I was taught um firefighting it was pick that hose line up go in there put the fire out and i was like on it. yeah yeah we, we, same as we, we basically I... did not taught anything about hold the line yeah i told you like the american there's nobody better at moving hose line than americans yes you should definitely take a lot of positions to everything i'm just not like you can't spend you can't expect people to go out and do like the clamp move four t- hours every week yeah and so then, have and then like you can come back to yeah. the realities of, of, of we talk about training scars, you know, like yeah. our training buildings don't have junk down the hallway. Yeah. Every house that has a fire in it has junk, junk on the floor. The it has yeah. lots of furniture. It has all yeah. so like moving around the parking lot sets you up for cert like definitely sets you up for a system. But after X amount of hours investment. That's a system of diminishing returns. You're not yeah. learning anything anymore no. because you're not learning how to take that system and adapt it to the real world environment out here. It might be even the opposite. You're setting up people for failure because, like, th- there's a lot of and uh, and like programs are in America. I think people are setting up for failure because there's, there's basically two things that are not accounted for a lot of times. It's uh, three things. One, people don't want to train as much, so it doesn't work. Uh, unless there's a few how to communicate about moving the host line and so on. Two, like you said, it does not often not account for the messiness of the real world. I mean, I can't sit on this side in this position. I have to be on that side. You know, I have to move different positions. I have, sometimes I can't drag in a certain way. I have to switch to a different one, different one, different one, because there's objects. There's just a amount of problems. Uh, for me, the biggest problem, though, uh, well, training was the biggest problem. But the the other one was that how one or two works together was that we taught. Typically, we taught before that the, the tick should be on number two, because number two has a hand free. Uh, and the problem I had then was that when when I started switching towards that we should advance to the fire as fast as possible. Now, uh, number one always had to wait for number two, to scan and, and like that. So it became it became slow, because in reality, most fires are pretty non-complicated. Firefighter one wants to advance really fast because they even might even see visually want to go. They have to wait for number two to to drag enough host line. Uh, and then we start. So I wanted to place the the tick on number one. So of course that's better because now if it, if the number one doesn't have to flow water, 
constantly can scan and go really quickly towards the fire. And that is the norm. 90% of the fires, you, you may not even have to cool until you get to the fire compartment at all. Like most fires are small. So we want to have really yeah. rapid advancement to those fires, okay? But when we get to that fire, that 10% or 20%, whatever it might be, where number one has to stop to cool, maybe for a short time, for a long time, maybe we have to have to stop and really cool, cool constantly when moving forward, like it's a really bad fire. Now number two, since the advance is slower, have time to go up to number one and hold the camera in front of number one's face. So for me, it was really important that we... I want the camera number one because most fires are fast and we want to have number one should go as fast as possible to the fire to be able to ventilate. That's, that's, that's the, that's the objective. As soon as you slow down, number two, start having time because they, they, they loop down some, some, some holes inside the hallway, boom, up to number one, start holding the tick. So a lot of the, the practices I see on host movement doesn't take into account that you need to work together with the tick. You don't have yeah. three arms. So that was also one of the big issues I had. I need to have a way of, of, of a very non-scripted way of moving with a host line. Just tricks in here, tricks in here, because in reality it's messy. And it's, there's not, not going to be like a perfect push when number two goes behind number one. Because I want to have that tick being able to go. As soon as number one stops, number two should go up and, and after it you know, makes a short loop so that you can advance up and, and help number one. Now, in some contexts, and some people in America, if I talk to them, they say, well, like, you don't need to take. Like, if you know it's hot, just just, just cool and, and go. And that's true. If you don't care, if you know exactly where you're going, <laughs> but I'm going to go like, I'm sitting at, at stru uh, acquired structure fires, and I start, I start saying, look, that's the place I want to go. It's five meters ahead of me. If I try to advance that one, zero visibility, don't see anything. Don't see a stream, don't see the... Not, not, uh, uh, everything sure i might be able to figure out if i'm turning or going a sideways if i listen but now i'm a i'm a experienced doing that like a new recruit it's too much they will end up going that direction going that direction yeah. because you lose orientation so fast so in reality you need these constant checkups that you're going the right direction and you also probably want to verify that you're being effective with the stream like you're actually getting cooling capacity so you get those stops all the time, well, at least most of the time when you're doing, you get those stops constantly and then number two comes up and helps you with the tick. Now, if the firefighter one stops and he doesn't have to cool or doesn't feel have to cool, of course, they pick up the, the thermal imager and do it by themselves. Oh, oh, it looks good. I want to go that way. I'll just go. Again, that was, that was another part that wasn't... I wasn't happy with looking at just uh, Americans working out in the parking lot and saying like, ah, I think that's that's the right way to go, at least for, for where I was teaching and looking at it. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, brilliant points there. Um, one. Yeah, you can go, bull you can, you can go bullshit, Gerard, if you, <laughs> you can say, you can pull the bullshit card. I don't believe that, Lars. Oh. I'll just say, like, I think it's a mixture. And I've probably adopted a mid-Atlantic approach to everything we do. Yeah. And the mid-Atlantic. So, like, having traveled to the U.S. and done conferences and training there, I've been able to take away some really interesting stuff and some amazing yeah. stuff and speak to some really good people um, who are quite knowledgeable on what they, they do and how they do it. At the same time, I, I have to put it into the context of a European firefight. Yeah. Because... I know, I know we're in the Southern Hemisphere, but we're still part of the British <laughs> uh, the British Commonwealth. And, you know, we, we fight our fires. Like, when I go to England, I've been to England a couple of times. Um, when I've gone there, I feel, from a fire service perspective, that I've come home. Yeah. Like, I can see why I do everything. Because I'm like, oh, yeah. sick. This is, this is where we came from. Um, but I, I see some of the English stuff is really good, too. But... Uh, and European stuff is really good too, but like, and and not to sound, not to sound like someone we both know. Well, it depends, <laughs> <laughs> but we need to be able to to address some context in there where both systems work, and then put parameters on yeah. that limit the training scars, but increase efficiency and effectiveness. Yeah, that's in, how. In, in the end of the day, you have to either you have to know enough what it depends on to figure out your own guidelines or you yeah. have to create guidelines in advance that make make sense that are efficient enough or effective enough to work because 
I realized myself, I was heavily training scarred by the, the Swedish fire service, which had a philosophy of, if you know everything, you'll figure it out. Yeah. Um, which doesn't work because you don't have time to analyze. Like there's not enough time. When I, my, when my, I was done with my analyst <laughs> analysis, that, that moment was already gone. It was either slow or I had to analyze again, basically. Yeah, I, 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 there was too much I was missing. I was, I was basically failing as an officer, I thought, because I know too much and I have too few guidelines constructed my own. Like and, the more. And the, 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 that's what catches you up too. And you can only know so much on yeah. the truck in, in yeah. two minutes. So you, you can only work out so much about the house we're responding to. Yeah. You're not going to know a lot about it. No, there's too many. I like when I, I, mean, I remember going to fire and, and I had this bit checklist in my head about what I need to check before pull up going into structure. Like, you know, is it, is it, is it going to collapse? What's the fire behavior look like? Is there hazardous materials? Do we have a power problem? Like where do we have people? Is a, might be a, a chem, like a, like a, like a hash, like it's a, it's a likely to be some kind of strange hazardous materials that we don't think about. There's so many things that it's sort of like a, 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 on the checklist I should do to be a good officer and do like safety, for instance. Uh, and I realized that to do that checklist, even if we sit in a room with a PowerPoint looking at a, like an arrival video, we're stuck like an hour and discussing those things. Uh, I go like, yeah, you have you have four seconds when you arrive to make that decision. <laughs> go like that's that's not gonna happen. I go like, so we'll just go. Eh, looks good. Let's go. Uh, so I was going like, that doesn't help because uh, I realized, and it, it's the same everything. When I go into a house as a firefighter and I go like, it's just dark and messy and everything. There's there's fifty different things to look at. But like, I don't have time to analyze. Like I I just I just do. So I had to create guidelines for myself like you know do this this is the most most important thing if this not that do this uh, basically create those those frameworks in my head uh simplify things and that's what i teach like i teach this the simplified thing now the more we understand why about that we can adopt and tweak and so on but you have to have those guidelines because you have to make a to-do list see this do this but it can't be a wish list you can't see see this this are the 15 different options you have because that's a wish list and, and it's yeah. not a to-do list so no. you have to do these things and that, that has to be one or two options maybe three like if and you I reckon, see i reckon a lot of instructors get caught in the in the habit too of sprinkling a bit of spice on yeah like oh do you know you could take the hinges off this or do this yeah, or do yeah. that you'll limit the damage and i'm like well no, like in my no. head i sit there and i go there's a fire yeah if i have to break a door to put the fire out surely the fire <laughs> It's, it's the priority. priority. <laughs> yeah. No, it is. But I, I think I think that's, I I am highly guilty of that. I try to do mm. less, uh, of sure. But if I go back, because uh, for two reasons: one, being an instructor, I want to be seen as knowing things. Like yeah. I I want them to. And, and it, it, there's a dark side of that and a good side. The dark side, of course, I, I just want to be a hero. I want to be seen as a badass hero. Everybody should look up to me. But on the other hand would be, I want to give them as many tools as I, as they, as I can. So it was done in a way that I, I'm trying to do good. Um, it's a hierarchical structure. Like you have to have information to yeah. give them. That's why yeah. they're there. Yeah. yeah. So, so I was trying to give them as much as possible, which is half true when it goes to instructors. I, I tend to give instructors too much sometimes, but mostly I'm placed there as a source of inspiration. And they have to take, okay, what is the essential parts here that we want to convey down to our students? Because someone has to break it down to that simple to-do list. And the Swedish saying of, which exists all over the world, like, oh, that's a tool in toolbox. Good. It's good to have many tools. No, like, no, no, not at all. It's not a profession in the world that, like, the more tools you have, the more you default to the one you know. Like, you have, yeah. like, two 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 options or three maybe for each situation is more than you you pro probably could handle anyway because there's so many situations on the fire ground okay if i if i go around this corner and i have five different ways of, of dealing doing with the stream call like no i will just revert back to the one i usually do okay now mm. but if i have two options you either go when you look down a hallway you either go either i flow and move or either i flow all the time that's the only two re 
two options you have. Now you maybe create simplest, simplistic enough to actually work. Yeah, hundred uh, so, percent. And like, yeah. but but then but then we can compound that problem by saying, cool, we've got two tactics that work in a hallway to a room fire. Yeah. Now we're in a factory. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, now short... we're in this, yeah. and and now I've got to have two new options for for those type of things because, and and I, I probably want to segue because I see time's getting away on us um, into talking about something that I've been thinking about and I want to get your thoughts on it. Where I've been reading research by um, Professor Rain on traveling yeah. fires coming out of yeah. Edinburgh, yeah, and. What I'm understanding there is that there's another fire curve, which that blew my mind because the whole time I've been studying firefighting, everyone's gone, here's time, here's temperature, here's a line, here's some different yeah. stages. And if I play with the ventilation, we can change that line a bit. Yeah. Right. But everything will get to a uniform temperature. So basically, split into uniform temperature compartment fire theory and yeah. non uniform temperature compartment fire theory so when we yeah. get to that big space yeah um because when i was taught we were never taught that droplets or cfbt had kind of a range like a maximum space where yeah. that's affected yeah and then so if that's the case how do we start teaching these other things so we stop having very tragic fires in very big buildings that have very benign fires in them on arrival yeah but then move to very serious fires quite quickly Oh, that's a huge issue, I, and I, I, uh, but I will. Well, uh, and and to be fair, I don't think there's any. Um, there's so few best practices and anecdotal evidence, or even scientific evidence, to go like, oh, this is the case for, for big volume firefighting. That there's a huge. Most fire departments in the world fail in big boxes, like that. Yeah, where just, on that? Yeah. is massive straight streams of large volumes of water yeah. into the internal ceiling. Until it burst yep. down. It, and, and try and hit the roof <laughs> yeah. and make big sprinklers and yeah. then step them up. Or use your aerials and instead of putting, and, and this is quite controversial, this thinking, right? Yeah. But instead of putting your ladder platforms and turntable ladders above the fire squirting yeah. the roof, we could bring them down and put them in an opening and squirt yeah. the roof on the underside. Yeah, no, I sounds excellent <laughs> i would do the same thing which is but yeah that would be that would be some sort of controversial oh it would just be non-traditional <laughs> maybe, pe maybe people don't go oh you're 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 a maverick but it definitely that, that's not how you typically do it no no i think that's that, that's excellent inputs um uh, now uh, again I, first off i want to start by um the fire curve so one problem with, with compartment fire between training at least uh, a lot of times is again traveling fires in that sense aren't different towards a house fire because a house fire has not a uni unified compartment it's different fire curves for every compartment so you would have that it, the fire it would be flashed over in this compartment but outside it would be basically a fire building up it would be a fuel control fire now it, it, if you go to big box the same thing if you have travel and fire there would be a flash over in this this base a bit basic here and then you have basically a fire curve here but on the other part there would just be a radiation coming so uh, and that could of course speed up or slow down depending on how much fuel it has or how much oxygen it has so in some sense it's just it's just a it's just a compartmentalized fire in a big house it's just that we don't have any walls uh, it, it, in that sense, so we have a so get firefighters to understand like we can have a flashover in this part and what what sort of what we typically describe as a flashover, huge radiation on the surfaces, you know floor you know combusting and so on, but further away from that flashover, regardless if there's a wall or not, there's not enough heat reaching those surfaces yet, so that part of the building is not going to flash over. So I think that's one issue that we need to sort of bring into it. Like the, the, in some sense, it's not a big difference. But on the other hand, of course, in practice, we have no way of compartmentalizing. Like we, if I'm going into a building and we have these different rooms with different parts of the fire curve in different stages, if I suppress one room and there's a doorway to the next one where there actually it's a flashover or like this, the danger I'm in is is very low because I have that partial separation of the wall. I mean, it's just a doorway coming out, but the radiation is basically inside that room. 
it's a yeah, you yeah. Know, it's a massive difference. So when we get to a big box to understand traveling fires, I think is the easy part. Now the practical part, how to deal with that, that's a whole different ball game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so I mean typical by a teacher go like if you have a large volume. So one simple thing I just I just teach it. If you have a large volume, fire is further in that you can sort of spray water on, you just lob it in. If you have ceiling temperatures above 150 degrees, if you go up with your thermal image, you indicate above 150 degrees in the ceiling, that far away from the fire in that volume space, you, you should probably not be in there. Like yeah, the, it's what, what very, can, very hard. It's, it, yeah. I mean, it's, it's what, what, what can you do with the, with the, with the normal host line, the potential for problems, because can you get close to that fire? The roof construction is going to be hot. Most big buildings are not built to withstand that kind of heat for any period of time whatsoever. So, yeah. uh, if you have that, if you've gotten that stage now, if, it, if it's not gotten that, stage, it's just cold smoke in the ceiling and there's a fire further in. Now you have options. Now you have options to move in there. Maybe you go with the dry line and pressurize when you get close to it. Maybe again, if it's a small fire going with dry cams, because there's different options and so on. Now, if you get into the point where it's 150 degrees or, or maybe that's a, sort of that just up. It's just a number I use because that's the number where you can start having any impact with your water. It's just, yeah. but it's, it's sure. So I'm using and the just, same. And it's, just to note that number is, is dependent upon a lot of things, but it's giving yeah. us a guide that that's it hot is, and it's hot enough that it's heating up a solid. Yeah. It's, it's just, yeah. it's just a sort of like basically pulled out of my ass halfway, but yeah. it's just like an indicator. Like if it's 50 above the ceiling, probably not a problem, but it's starting to get it, starting to get there. If 150 yeah. starting, probably should think about five or six times before should we really enter here you know if we even get to the fire do we have enough power and angles to actually get there what happens if the seal and neutral ceiling just drops down and do can we find our way out and so on so we get to that point where it's 150 degrees or maybe 300 degrees or 500 degrees so so what do we do we basically have two two main main options at least for me or we combine them one we close everything down which you should Regardless, everything should be closed yeah. down because if we get to that point, st the fire started to get bigger and we want it to be as slow as possible. We want to, we want to have as little auction as possible. That's, that's critical. And for some reason, firefighters have been taught in small buildings to, at least in big parts of Europe, uh, close everything down. But in buildings, go like, ah, we want to open everything up because it's fire is different. No, no, it's not. It's like, it's, it's, it just takes longer to get to the point where it starts to become auction limited. But it's also that we have degrees of auction limited. If you just if you just lower the inlet to inlet air coming in, basically even if the door is closed, there's always an inlet to the fire. It's just recirculating from from old air. If that goes to twenty percent, now it's slower. If it goes to ninety percent, it's slower. It it will not resume. It will not stop flame and combustion, but it will get slower and slower and slower. So anything we can do to do that it would be beneficial. So. That's that's you'd have to close the inlets. Now, if you close the inlets, now you either have two options. Basically, like in theory, again, you can find it. You want to get like cobras and piercing also in to see if you can start rotating get the some smoke humidity around. in there. Yeah, yeah you want to rotate. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you want to find yeah. basically you want to find the hottest place you can reach through a wall or ceiling, whatever it might be. Try to get that stream in. Higher the pressure, the better, because you want to create rotation of the space. And every time when that smoke starts to rotate back into the stream, you're cooling it down and creating steam. And you're cooling it down, creating steam. And the the bet, more heat you have, the easier it becomes. Which is one of those counterintuitive arguments where you go like, well, it's a small fire. Now, now you can't. There's not enough heat to use really steam as a good suppressant. The the, the bigger the fire is, the easier it is. Is uh, so you want to create that steam. Uh, piercing nozzles, different places. You just have to place them like. Uh, if, if the objective is to have a straight stream base go through a wall, that's a piercing also. Go to the size, it's probably useless. Like a piercing also should 99% of the time just go forward to be able to, to create as much forward momentum as possible so that you start to push it, everything forward and start to rotate it back into the stream on the side because you want to rotate that entire space. If you have a small compartment, it doesn't matter because if you put it to the side, it will make, mix everything. But as soon as you get up to any sort of volume size, you have want to get it forward. So you, let's say you have a big, if you have a square box and you want to cool that down, you want to paste, you don't want to paste two piercing nozzles like this because they won't, they will 
they will push to the to the other. Yeah, they'll, they'll wanna, interact with each other. Yeah, yeah. And, and you don't want to push them like this. You want to put you want to have them like this, so that they mm -hmm. they start to rotate like this. You want to turn an entire space. And if you have a like a restaurant or a, like a small a small industrial place, you can definitely do that. Two cobras for different places, excellent. Like like high pressured. You can you can you can make surprisingly. Yeah, was it you that had the video of the barn? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember watching that and seeing that surprise. Like, so I'm sitting there, like, no way that's going to put that out. Yeah, and like, if it's that steam saturation 40, mixing, 45, oh. 50 liters per minute. Put it <laughs> again. The bigger fire you have, the more the easier it would become because it just you're just building up. It's not about people go like, no, that the heat release is too big. No, it's not about heat release rate. The heat release it goes down when steam concentration goes up. So they will just go like this. Because uh, we're preventing the oxygen saturation. You're preventing the oxygen, so yeah. so you, you're 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 building out two percent of steam, five percent, ten percent. We get to a certain critical point, it will it will overcome the heat release rate. It will just basically it will lower the heat release rate as we go, and when it reaches that threshold, it just goes out. But it, it 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 it's depending on that we're creating enough steam, which is depending on that you have new hot stuff coming into the stream. So if you put the stream far away from the fire and start to partially rotate a space away from the fire and that gets cold, nothing happens. You're just creating water on the floor. You're constantly, the, 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 the objective is to get constantly new heat into the stream so that you continuously vaporize the steam. So that's one part of the, of the of the solution. You want to have piercing also, so you want to rotate the span, space. You want to make it basically as much steam as possible. Everything will, will gather in the ceiling. Now you can you can you can complement that with straight streams. For instance, you go with him in the nozzle, you go on with a with a with a with a with a portable monitor. You go in there with an aerial, try to limit oxygen as much as possible, and you move it upside. But again, what's it creating? You're creating a straight stream in the ceiling with forward momentum. You want to have that forward momentum again working with the circulation of that space. So you want to you want to you want to amplify in that case the piercing nozzle, or you want to replace it with a straight stream that pushes it. If you put all the straight stream in the same position, push it the same way, you're not going to get that rotation. Now that might work if you have enough straight streams. It might be two, it might be one, depending on how large it is. If you have enough straight streams going, so that you can, like you say, you can sequentially move forward, so you're just basically pushing everything in forward, nothing circulates mm -hmm. back. That might work, but traditionally you have a large space going with a straight stream. You maybe start getting up in the ceiling really good, but it doesn't cover enough. So, you, so the heat just goes in behind it. Now you're advancing basically into a, a box where you get a little bit of cooling in front of you, but around you just keeps feeding that heat in behind you. Uh, and now you're basically in, in a bad position, which is why I think that the, the, it's the same thing you go like with thermal imagery. It's so easy a lot of times to spot this. You're going forward, and you see that the heat goes around you. You can't do anything about it. You just got to retreat. You're not in a good position. Go in there with two streams. Now try to work it, push it forward. You see that no heat is going through the streams. No heat is going around it, or at least not a massive. Now you're winning. Now you can advance. Hmm. Uh, but it is like those two things. If, if, if to me, if, if, if there's nothing to save in there, like it's going to burn down anyway why would you even go in there you just you want to have you want to have maybe reduce the amount of, of of heat release rate to protect other buildings you just go in there create a lot of steam let it burn down under controlled control basically controlled burn down you don't want to create massive amounts of water damages because uh, <clears throat> that that's not damage to the structure that's damage to the ground yeah to the environment if, if, you, if you go in with, with, with any monitor yeah. this is my argument to that point so if you go in there and you say, hey, let's let it burn, and we're like you just brought up groundwater uh, pollution, for example, yeah. from factory factory fire runoff. And look, I've been to fires where we've polluted local creeks and yeah. it hasn't been good, right? But if that's the case, why wouldn't we burn the fire as hot as we can so that we have as little... Oh, yeah. Um, so that would be yeah, that would, oh, absolutely. Yeah. If you, if you decide yeah. to burn down, you want to burn yeah, you want to put fans on it. You want to burn as yeah. fast as possible. Now, because like I look at it, yeah, yeah we're absolutely. real big on the cancer stuff. Yeah, right. And and for good reason. And yeah. and I'm so proud of where we are with our decontamination and our all that kind of stuff. The one thing I'm scared that we're losing though is the ability to put the fire out. Yeah. Now, if you put the fire out 
really, really quickly, you've limited your exposure time and your chance to yeah. be exposed to those cancer causing chemicals. So I think that we, we, if you're going to make a decision to let it burn, burn it really hot. Yeah. Just make sure it doesn't burn anything else around it. <laughs> yeah, that, but that would be, but that would be typically the reason you can't because there's, there's just yeah. so much built up environment. So you have yeah. to limit it just to make sure that you know, shit bit, doesn't burn yeah. around it. But yes, option one in that case, let it burn, burn as hot as possible. Option two, burn it down as slowly as possible, but just using water, just using high pressure, steam, all the things, try to keep it as contained as possible until you can't. And then you have to make a decision. Increase the risk of fire spread, but pollute in the groundwater. Because every shit yeah. in that building, you're going to take down in the water, and you will flush it down into drinking water, everything. So all the cancerous stuff, you're going to have the, all the neighbors is going to get cancer. Yeah. Probably not, but over time, you know, it's not good. Uh, or, <laughs> if they or, burn it down one week, it's yeah, going to be real bad. Yeah. So, yeah. so that, I mean, they have to make a decision, but yeah, I'm absolutely right. Now, like you said, on the cancer issue for firefighters, no, I don't want to put firefighters in, in that fire for no reason whatsoever, uh, it, it, even if it's to burn down slowly. Um, the cancer issue for me, I mean, that, that's a whole separate argument. There's so many things I would like to talk about that one too. But I'm actually trying to, I, I would probably do uh, an educational video series about how to look at these topics because sometimes it just gets totally out of hand. Uh, but oh, I want to nice. link. I want to link everything from strategy and training down to like personal protection gear. On trying to so look, where do I where do I stand on these positions? But but one of the things I think is so important is that like if we have a mindset of we want to do as best as we can for the victim, that that is typically good for us. We want to reduce if we reduce talk acute toxic exposure to victims, we reduce long term exposure to us. Of course, also acute, but that's typically we have breathing apparatus. So for instance, that yeah. uh, the the way of operating. Uh, of going, we want to go in, we want to basically flow as much as we can, short really time as we can do and working fast, as fast as we can to the fire compartment, massively ventilate after that. That's good for the victim, it's good for us. So that, yeah. but that it's the, 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 that way of operating is not dictated for our long term risk of exposure. It's just a really nice add on. And we reduce the amount of exposure to the building, like, like, you reduce the risk of it collapsing and so on. Those are nice benefits. It comes from uh, having a way of operating that is, we want to get to the stage of ventilation as fast as possible without ventilating too early to make, you know, burn everybody to death. Making it less, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well, um, I'll have to pull it up there just because I've got something to do. So yeah, I've got stuff um, to do too. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, uh, Listening to this, I reckon you and me could probably ask each other questions, have a conversation. Yeah. I could ask you questions and we could have a debate about the answer for quite some yeah. time. But thank you so much for your time, mate, and I uh, really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate it too, Jerome. Yeah.